This evening, I hope to uh, impress upon your mind a concept and practice which I discovered from Freemasonry, from my Masonic studies in particular, uh, which I found to be invaluable uh, as I navigate this world and interact with its inhabitants. I believe strongly that this is one of the most profound teachings in Freemasonry, and it's not talked about very often. Uh, it's pretty predominant in the traditional observance uh, lodges, but as we dive a little deeper this evening, I hope that you uh, obtain some pieces of knowledge that you can take home with you uh, to uh, improve yourself in masonry. So this evening, we're going to learn. We're going to learn to subdue our passions, and we're going to improve ourselves in masonry. So if that's not what we're here to do, then I'm not sure what is. In our ritual, we are charged to subdue our passions. We're charged to circumscribe our desires and to keep our passions within due bounds. What does that mean to you guys? What, what, what is that? How do you interpret that? Anybody? Anybody else? What are passions? Those are two different things. So my point I'm making is that these are very vague. And I think as a lot of things in masonry, they're vague on purpose because it gives us some flexibility to interpret them for how we need to interpret them to improve ourselves. But what I'm going to talk about this evening, we're going to narrow the parameters a little bit and go a little deeper into uh, the um, allegorical relation of these charges to the hermetic principle of polarity. Um, we'll actually be talking about multiple hermetic principles in addition to the hermetic principle of polarity. So it seems important that we talk about the star of the show. Hermes Trismegistus, thrice great. Um, who's heard of Hermes? Most everyone. So Hermes uh, became known from the uh, discovery of the pyramid texts uh, about some 5,000 years ago during the dynastic period of the Egyptian. Um, he is referred to as the world teacher. As we go back into antiquity, there has been quite a bit of people, uh, quite a number of characters that have carried that title. Um, in fact, the, one of the coolest things that I discovered uh, or read was that in the Aboriginal tribes in Australia, they have story, a story of a world teacher uh, arriving by watercraft some 42,000 years ago. And when I say world teacher, an example of world teacher that would resonate probably with more of you than Hermes is Jesus Christ. Buddha, Muhammad, Krishna, uh, individuals that have been assigned um, a higher and elevated spiritual status in society uh, because of the teachings that they brought to the civilization in which they existed. The teachings of Hermes were, quite frankly, uh, pretty similar across multiple um, mythologies. Egyptian mythology was where he was initially originated, as we understand it. And then it carried into Greek mythology. And so uh, the Hermeticism uh, was born around 3, 000, uh, 300 BC, around the time that the Egyptian society was melding into more of the Greek uh, mythology. 
and Hermes has been attributed to uh, alchemy, astrology, mysticism, spiritual wisdom, writing, magic. Uh, he's referred to as thrice great uh, because of his mastery over the three parts of wisdom, alchemy, astrology, and theurgy. So his influence was so great that a, a spiritual, philosophical, and esoteric tradition was created in his honor. At its core, Hermeticism is the pursuit of deeper knowledge and insights into the nature of the universe, into the divine, and into the self. As I mentioned earlier, in the addition to the Hermetic Principle of Polarity, we'll be talking about many other, uh, or a couple of the other Hermetic Principles, so it feels appropriate for us to walk through each one of these principles to touch on them briefly. The first Hermetic Principle we'll discuss is the Principle of Mentalism. The Hermetic Principle of Mentalism is basically all is mine. The universe is mine. If you've heard of the law of attraction, a uh, similar concept. Uh, simply put, uh, your thoughts control your reality. Most especially your perception of reality. This effectively emphasizes the fundamental role of the mind or conscience in shaping and influence the world around you. The next hermetic principle is a principle of correspondence. This is one I would imagine that most of you are the most familiar with, as above, so below. Basically, what this alludes to is that the common rules and laws that govern the world and govern matter are the same across every plane. You can see this in um, the synopsis of the brain. If you, if you do a stack ranking picture or a, a comparative picture, of the uh, close-up of the neurons in the brain firing and a uh, picture of the universe with the galaxies and solar systems, they're quite similar. Also, if you look at a cross-section of the energy flow of the body against the cross-section of the light flow of a black hole, they're very similar. So it leads us to believe that there leads us to assume uh, that there are rules that are governing, uh, the same rules govern every plane of existence. The third hermetic principle is the principle of vibration. Everything in this world, in this universe, vibrates. At our uh, molecular level, we're made up of atoms and atoms vibrate from uh, terahertz, which is 10 to the 12th power hertz, that's 13 zeros, to petahertz, which is 10 to the 15th power. So it's 16 zeros is the rate of vibration. So we're all vibrating, everything's vibrating, even light waves vibrate in their own way. The next principle is a principle of rhythm. Everything flows in and out. And again, when we talk about these principles, we're talking about not just our plane of existence, but the planes above and below us. When I, when I speak of planes above and below us, an example of a plane below us would be at the quantum level. So if we zoom in at the atomic level or quantum level, uh, the rules that govern the rhythms that we experience here in our plane, example being the sun and the moon, the tides that flow in and out, those same rules are also governing different planes. So the rhythm that we experience is also experienced on other planes as well. Everything flows in and out. Everything flows in and out every 24 hours as we hear in some of our ritual. So growth, decay, and renewal. The principle of cause and effect. Every cause has its effect and every effect has its cause. Nothing happens by chance. 
the principle of gender. Uh, this is one that I find most interesting um, just because this is one that I feel that I can see and experience uh, in the day to day. So um, male and female aspects are prevalent in every component of matter. In our in ourselves, we have the male and female components of our mind. In nature, there's male and female components. So when I say male and female components and everything's gender, I'm not referring to sexual gender. What I'm referring to is generative and productive components of everything in existence. Who can point to our, who can point to what's, or who, who can tell me what's symbolic of the uh, hermetic principle of gender uh, within our lodge? Well, I know you can. These are symbolic of the hermetic principle of gender. And we're, we're live recording, so I, I, will, I won't give any more uh, words upon that. But uh, basically everything has masculine and feminine, and they're manifested in all planes of existence. And we're taught uh, very profoundly uh, that that is important. Now, so for this evening, uh, one of the primary uh, components of the, uh, the meat of what we're going to talk about as we progress through this uh, discussion is the principle of polarity. It's obvious we all see it hot and cold, light and dark, good and evil. In the Tao, it says beauty is beautiful. If everyone in the world believes beauty is beautiful, then ugly exists. If everyone in the world believes good is good, then evil exists. When we talk about the principle of polarity as it relates to emotions, it seems logical that if you, we don't know any better, we would look at um, happy and sad as two completely different destinations in which we find ourselves um, at different points in our lives, when in reality they're the same thing. They are varying degrees of the same essence. So when we understand and when we talk further about subduing our passions, we look at emotions, opposing emotions as not two separate things, but as just existing on a same plane with one extreme on one end of sad, one extreme of happy on the other end, and varying degrees in the middle. That's a, we'll illustrate that in a little bit more detail as we progress. Now it starts to get fun. So who can tell me what this symbol means? Give me an example. Okay. Anyone else? It represents nothing. Nothingness. So, Masonically speaking, you're right. This does refer to the bounds in which we maintain our emotions. The benefits from that is self-control, moderation, and all of these wonderful things. Probably why it's repetitive in our ritual and it comes up quite regularly. Because in order for us to be upright masons, we must um, control our emotions and hold ourselves to a higher standard than the rest of society. Most especially in circumstances in which it's easy to lose our temper. This also is part of the earth and the sun. Spir uh, spiritual and esoteric um, use of it is uh, refers to it 
as uh, enlightenment, the divine or the interconnectedness of all things. Well, we're going to talk about a little bit. Um, we're going to we're not going to go directly towards it, but we're going to talk at it. Uh, is this symbol uh, in its um, being referred to as the mandala, which is Carl Jung and effectively a symbol which is used to integrate the conscience and the subconscious. This symbol is going to be employed um, quite a bit as we progress through this, so I wanted to talk about its multiple um, interpretations and multiple uses. So for the first uh, situation in which we're going to use the point within a circle, I want to illustrate how we're going to use it. So this is the circumplex model of effect, which a psychologist ideated, and it became a mainstream use for uh, comparing and contrasting the valence and arousal of contrasting emotions back in the mid-20th century. I show this to you as an example of how we're going to use the point within a square or the point within a circle. The circle is going to be representative of contrasting emotions, uh, the comprehensive collection of all emotions, contrasting emotions being on opposite sides. So this is a visual to help us grasp that as we progress. So now we're talking about circumscribing our desires and keeping our passions within due bounds. And now we understand that the circle on the outside is a comprehensive collection of all of our emotions. So where should we be? Inside the circle? What's outside the circle? So it's largely subjective based on our own interpretation of this. For the purpose of progressing this conversation, uh, we all can agree that it's uh, very complex to navigate and analyze and process all the emotions at the same time. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this circle, the point within a circle from a different perspective. We're going to lay it on its side and we're going to discuss emotions one contrasting pair at a time on one plane. So now let's talk about individual emotions. So joy and sorrow. So is, is absolute joy the complete absence of sorrow? Agree or disagree? Someone brave enough that disagrees, elaborate please. That's right. So if you know joy, wouldn't you also know sorrow? Right? So absolute sorrow is the complete absence of joy. If you don't have joy, then you could say you're on a plane towards being a little bit sorrowful, maybe. Absolute. I would say that an absolute is a hypothetical and it's based off data and world form, and that it's not something that we could ever truly know. But from a logical perspective, if something is 100% on one end of the spectrum, it would preclude the other one from existing. That would be the best. Thank you. Courage and fear. So if, we're, if we will take into consideration that uh, utilizing the term absolute is within bounds this evening, can we say that absolute courage is the complete absence of fear? No. You don't think so? So you can be courageous and fearful at the same time. Many people say that a courageous person is the only one who has fear of something you can gladly do both. You cannot know courage without fear. You cannot know joy without sorrow. If you only knew joy and you only knew courage, there would be non-existence. So you have to have the opposite, which Albert Pike 
refers to as the equilibrium of the cost recovery. There, I get that. What about love and hate? Is absolute love the complete absence of hate? What, what is the complete absence of love? Sociopathy. <laughs> Sociopathy indeed. Perhaps the complete absence of love is indifference. We agree? And we could also say the complete absence of hate could also be indifference. So that'll, we'll, we'll refer back to that here in a few slides, but I wanted to, to point that out. That I don't think love and hate are on the same plane. I believe very strongly that love and hate originate in different areas of our being. Now, we talk about emotion, so and we're going to bring in the hermetic principle of cause and effect. So if we consider emotions the effect, what is the cause? Ourselves. Specifically? How do we choose to react? Just keep it shallow, like kiddie pool. Our thoughts? specific reactions based on what I call mental subroutines, based on past experiences. Uh, once they get out of bounds, you start getting into uh, philosophical bad faith, uh, neuroses, things like that. But uh, if, they're, if they're contained in new bounds, then uh, you can much better control that. So would you, would you agree... I'm going to try to simplify that for the purpose of this illustration. So if we simplify that, could we say that our thoughts are the cause and the emotions are the effect? Okay. So if we want to subdue our emotions, if we want to control our emotions, then we must control our thoughts. Is that fair? We tracking? If we control your thoughts, then you can control your emotions. So we're going to talk about our thoughts. We're going to talk about controlling our thoughts because emotions are just a byproduct of what we think. So what I've, I want us to consider this linear plane with the arrows in the circle to be representative of the absolute subduction of our thoughts. So there are two, so if, so if we look at subduing our thoughts on a plane, on one end, our thoughts control us. You all probably know someone who is ruled by their thoughts and their rational mind alone. If we talk about the absolute other end of the spectrum, when our thoughts are completely subdued, that's what this represents for the purpose of our discussion this evening. So this is illustrative of the absolute subduction of our thoughts. Now, to progress the conversation a little further, we have to look at this from a different perspective. So now we're back to the point within a circle. Now this, we're, the first time we saw the point within a circle, we were referring to our emotions. Now we're referring to our thoughts. And the point within a circle, to me, and to other um, applications of this symbol is representative of the absolute subduction of your thoughts. 
So if we want to subdue our passions, if we want to circumscribe our desires, if we want to keep our passions within due bounds, the most extreme example of a way in which we could do that is to absolutely subdue our thoughts. Is that possible? Well, where do thoughts come from? Does there, is there anyone in here that disagrees with the fact that there is a possibility that thoughts might arrive outside of our mind? Anyone disagree with that completely? So you think our, our thoughts are every 100% of our thoughts originate in our brain? Exactly. Surprise, surprise. Well, let's hear it. Let's hear it, Brother Driver. And that's evident by the presence of neural cells within the root of the main vessels coming out of the heart. While in the brain, the neurons act as not only transmitters uh, to chemical and electrical processes, but also they receive, and that's evident through the electromagnetic field that can be reported through electroencephalograms and through the heart, the electrocardiogram. So if all thoughts, good, bad, and indifferent thoughts, are part of the divine matrix that make up all of this that we are presumably aware of, then those thoughts are out there floating within that matrix. And our brain, our heart, is able to receive those thoughts. The question then becomes, how do you discriminate between this thought and that thought, one that, let's say, is on this spectrum good, or on that end of the spectrum bad? And that is where the equilibrium of the contraries has application. So, I so as a reception from the divine matrix. So they're vibrational in nature. I would like to point out that all of this is dualistic. <laughs> with, the, with, the, uh, with the fundamental impulse being that it's all in fact the same. Has anyone heard of uh, thought forms? Raise your hand if you've heard of thought forms. So thought forms is the theosophical idea. I'm going to call it, I'm going to appropriate it to theosophy. If I'm wrong, please correct me. Um, that thoughts are vibrations. And our the vibrations of our thoughts cannot be contained within our body. So we are walking around and other their thought forms floating around. So who has, I know everyone has, sat and had a thought pop in their mind, and you ask yourself, where the hell did that thought come from? Does everybody experience that? Okay, we all have. I can't confirm or deny this 100%. This is only speculation. But I believe that our thoughts can travel and do travel. I believe everyone's thoughts can and do travel. I believe when our thoughts, when we have a thought, I believe it is a vibrational frequency that travels. And when you talk about a collective conscience is effectively the accumulation of individual thoughts that are vibrating on the same frequency. And there's power in the cumulative collection of those thoughts. I won't go down that tangent, but I don't think thoughts are 100% originate in our brain regardless it is our responsibility to control our thoughts regardless of where they originate. 
how do we can how do we what is the best way that we can cultivate our minds to control thoughts? What are some exercises and practices? So I think it's thanking the word thanking. Like it interrupts the, the path that stops your thought process and you're headed down the track. I would say intro, introspection. Also allowing those thoughts to pass on. Letting go. Can anyone tell me the common denominator in every one of those things that were just mentioned? Focus. Focus. So whatever exercise we can do where we practice focus is an exercise in which our brains cultivate that skill. So our brains are like a muscle. Meditation is where we're going. So first answer was the right one within the parameters of this presentation. So I make a habit of meditating an hour each morning. And I get asked, a lot, and I I have asked a lot earlier in my years of learning and practicing meditation, is how do you meditate? I know people that meditate by listening to heavy metal. I know people that meditate by playing the piano. But what I'm going to talk about this evening is a particular um, type of meditation, and it's silent meditation. The funny thing about all of this is that the, there was there was an aha moment when I began to recognize my application of this point within a circle in my own meditational practice. So when I meditate, silent meditation, the goal is to remove all thoughts from your brain and maintain that for as long as you can. And we could all say that that's impossible. You're right, to a degree. But the benefit of silent meditation is not being without thought. The benefit of silent meditation is recognizing when a thought arises and grabbing the thought and bringing it back to center. Now, when I say center, I visualize this point within a circle in my brain, and I visualize that point being my pineal gland. And that's where you focus all of your thoughts. And they stay there, and you focus on the sensation of the breath entering your lungs and exiting your lungs. And you try to focus on your pineal gland, the center of your brain. Thoughts keep coming up. They're varying degrees of time in which they ramble in your mind before you can grab them and pull them back. But grabbing the thought and pulling it back to center is an exercise that trains your brain to better be able to do just that. So the more you meditate, the better your brain is able to grab a thought, bring it back to center, which is essentially how we focus. When we focus on something, we sit and we focus on one thing, and then we start daydreaming. Practicing the ability to recognize when we start daydreaming and focusing back is uh, beneficial. Spiritually, professionally, relationally, many different ways. So now I wanna talk about the state that we're in when, our, when we're completely devoid of thought. When we're completely when our, when our minds are focused, we'll call our pineal gland. I don't know if that's it. It just kind of feels like it is. It's fun to say it is. I, I don't know of a name that, that this is called, so I began to call it base zero when I talk to people. So base zero is what I call when my, my thoughts are completely centered and I'm completely still in my mind. In Epicurean philosophy, which is a philosophy that really focuses on prioritizing pleasure over pain, but a particular kind of pleasure, not the go out on Broadway on the weekend pleasure, but the long-term pleasure obtained from cultivating 
ourselves spiritually and physically. There's a state called ataraxy, which is a complete absence, complete calmness, and the complete absence of mental distress. So if the goal to silently meditate is base zero, to be completely devoid of thought, why is that? What, what's, what's the goal of meditation? What, how do we benefit from meditation? Raise your hand if you meditate regularly. We gotta get those numbers up. So, before we go further, I need to take a detour and talk about the concept and compare and contrast the intuitive and the rational mind. There's quite a bit to um, unpack with this slide, even though it's some pretty pictures. Um, effectively, the intuitive mind and the rational mind are two separate programs that receive data from environmental vibrations or waves. The rational mind receives data from our five senses, does its magic, and tells us what to do. The intuitive mind, um, I'm convinced, receives vibrations and waves um, from extrasensory sources that we don't really know about right now, or we haven't studied. The intuitive mind is subtle. Everybody has intuition. You know, we all have our intuition. We all say, um, just have a bad feeling about this. Or, you know, when we're trying to decide between job A or job B, I just have a gut feeling that I need to do this job or I need to make this decision. So we all have our intuition and we all have our intuitive mind, but we don't ever really talk about it here in the West. It's, it's, it's king in the East. Uh, they, they lead with the intuitive mind. Here in the West, we're a rational, rationally driven society. So our rational mind and our intuitive mind, there are a lot of different schools of thought that have different names for those. So, um, you know, your, your superego, your ego, and your id, uh, a lot of different, uh, but, but effectively what your rational mind and your intuitive mind do is provide you with information to, 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 to help you make the decisions in which you make on a daily basis. Now, in the West, that we don't cultivate our intuitive mind, we don't meditate, our intuitive mind just cultivates naturally under the radar. Generally speaking, our rational mind and our intuitive mind are at odds with each other. Who, said, who here has had their a gut feeling or their intuition told them something and it was wrong? Is that everybody, been, anybody ever been misled by their intuition? The value and the purpose and the benefit of meditation is cultivating your intuitive mind. Your intuitive mind is, is um, the, the sensation that you feel that is your intuition, that is your gut feeling, is subtle. And when you sit at base zero and your thoughts are focused in your pineal gland or in your brain, you're spending intimate time with your intuitive mind. And why is that important? Because your rational mind is appropriated to the male and your intuitive mind is appropriated to the female. So if we're talking about an absolute marriage of your conscience, of yourself, you must have your intuitive mind and your rational mind cultivated equally so they work in conjunction with each other. Otherwise, they work in 
against each other. Is everybody tracking? Is there any questions or is this all making sense? So we know how to cultivate our intuitive mind. We know why. Uh, so now um, let's talk about, the, so we talked about the benefits of it and, and, and the value of cultivating uh, your intuitive mind and the benefit of the relation of your intuitive mind to your rational mind. So those of you that have it, that do not meditate, um, I'm hoping that you see the value in meditating. And here is a plan that I use to begin meditating um, regularly. It's very daunting to say you're going to wake up and meditate an hour and sit still and not have any thoughts for an hour. So I started at 10 minutes every morning. And I've talked to people multiple times about meditating. And then uh, they say they're going to do it. And I check in with them a few months later and they haven't started meditating. I get where you don't want to go work out. That takes action. It takes physical exertion. But to meditate, you just you have to do nothing. You don't have to do anything. And it cultivates a component of our psyche that helps us be better positioned to excel in all of our vocations and in all of our relations. So the benefits of whole mind thinking. So whole mind thinking is essentially the when your uh, intuitive mind and your rational mind are, are perfectly married to each other. Um, in fact, there are stories of uh, individuals who, uh, so they're, uh, we've all heard of ayahuasca and psychedelics. So the, the psychosomatic effect of those substances allow you to commune with your intuitive mind at a much higher degree than what's possible in the real world without having to really work for it. So there's a little side note there that, um, and, and, and there's benefits in that there, there, you know, to a degree. Uh, there's a lot of studies and a lot of research that is being done right now on the, the cognitive and emotional benefits of those type of um, substances. So whole mind thinking is the complete marriage of the rational mind and the intuitive mind. So what is the benefit of that? So we now have the access of our hyper-tuned rational mind. That's how we were trained uh, our entire life. We now also, with a, with a cultivated intuitive mind, we also have the ability to pick up uh, signals and uh, vibrations from other sources as well. So not only are we using our five senses to navigate the world, we also have our intuition that is becoming more and more cultivated, which increases the value of our rational mind. Because again, when they're married, they're, they work with each other. Enhanced creativity and innovation. Your intuitive mind is, again, appropriated to the female. So the, the creative, the emotional, the abstract. Um, and so that, that increases uh, your ability to be creative, uh, increases your adaptability uh, and your flexibility. And also, when I mentioned earlier about uh, vibrations, thoughts, vibra thoughts that are your vibrations leaving your body, there are also vibrations that are related to your intuitive mind. So when you, we've all said it, uh, I don't like that, I don't like their vibe. Or I like their vibe, or we're vibing. Basically what they're saying is they're discussing the relation of their intuitive vibration related to the other person's intuitive vibration. So when you hone your intuition, you're better able to recognize the state in which the other person's intuition, intuitive mind is vibrating and you're able to intuit their mood. You're able to intuit many things. So again, the, the point I want to drive home is that the intuitive mind is a tool that we can cultivate that makes us a step above people that don't cultivate their intuitive mind. And you have to do, to cultivate it, you have to do absolutely nothing.
So it, it's a little bit, it, it's, it's fascinating to me that that is not a common, meditation is not a common practice in our society. We'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. So whole mind thinking, we, we, we hear emotional intelligence and, and we hear emotional intelligence. Um, so effectively, that is very tangential to whole mind thinking. So what you have is you have the integration of your brain and your emotions, where when we, we've all been in states where we felt somewhat irrational because our brain was telling us one thing and our heart was telling us another thing. We've all been there. So when we are a whole mind thinking, effectively, our rational mind and our intuitive mind are in lockstep with each other, and we don't have that um, contradiction. Enhance self-awareness, self-regulation, improve social skills. As I mentioned, your intuitive mind vibrates. You pick up the vibration of other people, and you're able to effectively engage in social situations by reading people, reading situations reading uh, conversations that, are, that you're walking into and having an idea of what you're walking into before you walk into it. Improve decision making and problem solving because again, you have an extra layer of data to make decisions. Data is everything. So if you have data from your five senses plus your intuitive mind and you're uh, competing or you're debating with someone who only has data from their five senses, then obviously, one extra data point gives you a leg up. Now I hope that I have done a, have, I, have I done a suitable job of, of giving the sales pitch on meditation? Raise your hand if you're going to start meditating. Oh man, could have done better. So in case I so I, not everybody raised their hand. So I'm going to make, I'm going to, I'm going to allow the teachings of masonry to drive the point home just a little bit more. As I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, I believe that this is one of the most profound lessons in masonry. And I believe that it is one of the most profound lessons in masonry because we are reiterated on multiple occasions. When I mentioned earlier about the intuitive mind and the rational mind, in the 16th century, the world was divided into the East and the West. This was when trade routes was open, mass transit, people were traveling. The Western world now refers to North America, the UK, the EU, The Western world is largely governed, dominated by the rational mind. Our educational system teaches us to cultivate our rational mind, to use our rational mind, and we never hear about our intuitive mind. We never meditate in school. Rational mind is king in the West. Adversely, the East is the opposite. The East, they begin practicing mindfulness, they begin practicing meditation, they begin having their kids spend time in silence, cultivating their intuitive mind. So it's a commonly, widely accepted notion that the Western world is dominated by the rational mind and the Eastern world is dominated by the intuitive mind. Now that's important because who all, how many EAs do we have in here? How many fellow crafts? Okay. So at least everyone in this room, at least one time, has traveled from one direction to the other direction in search of what? And that shows up constantly and Considering the benefits and considering the ancient 
time-tested value of cultivating your intuitive mind from a spiritual perspective, it's my belief that that is one of the most important things that masonry teaches us, is to cultivate our intuitive minds along with our rational minds to achieve complete whole mind marriage. And that's my talk. Who has questions or comments? <laughs>